So thank you for joining us today for the University of Iowa Heart and Vascular CME series with Dr. Balin on atrial fibrillation, new approaches, difficult cases, and complex patients. This, as you heard, this program is being recorded. Dr. Balin is a clinical associate a clinical associate professor of medicine who joined the university in 2016 after 25 years in private practice in Des Moines. He is a graduate of the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine and completed internal medicine residency at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then he had a com completed a cardiology fellowship and electro electrophysiology fellowship at the University of Minnesota. So Dr. Balin, thank you for joining us today. I think we're all very excited. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. So uh, my test today is a, is a bit broad. Um, we're talking about atrial fibrillation. And as you all know, um, it's a complex um, disease in that uh, individual patients uh, behave sort of unpredictably. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the issues that uh, arise in, in treatment. And first, um, we'll, uh, first we'll look at um, sort of general management. Um, of course, patients uh, will present with atrial fibrillation and sometimes they, they know it, sometimes they don't. Um, and the most important issue is addressing what um, risks they have for uh, development of uh, stroke. Um, and that's the CHADS-VASC-2 score. And for patients with a CHADS-VASC of zero or, or one, anticoagulation is uh, not indicated. Anticoagulation is indicated for patients that have a CHADS-VASC score of greater than two, or um, typically if we anticipate um, cardioversion, one would uh, wish to anticoagulate um, patients. So oftentimes the question becomes, how much atrial fibrillation is too much? And the answer is, we don't really know. Uh, it used to be easier in the old days because if people had atrial fibrillation that lasted less than 24 hours, we felt that their risk for stroke was quite small. Uh, however, um, because of implanted devices, um, we know that um, episodes of, of stroke can occur with a shorter duration of atrial fib. And therefore, um, I think when uh, one looks at uh, implanted devices, whether pacemakers, defibrillators, or loop recorders, uh, I think in part, there's sort of a gray area in terms of whether or not anticoagulation is indicated. Uh, and in part, I think that's uh, based on the chads bass score um, as well as the frequency and duration of the atrial fibrillation. So, uh, for example, um, short bursts of atrial fibrillation in a patient with low risk um, wouldn't necessarily trigger a need to go on to anticoagulation, but a patient that has very high risk uh, in the presence of uh, atrial fibrillation one would be inclined to treat. So, it gets a little messy. Um, apart from whether or not there's a risk of stroke, um, the issue is whether or not it's actually causing uh, symptoms or not. And uh, I think that's probably the most important thing uh, in terms of assessing atrial fibrillation is quality of life, what impact it has. So if patients don't have symptoms, uh, I think if a, if a patient is older, uh, one could decline um, a, an attempt at restoration of sinus rhythm, particularly in the setting of uh, long duration atrial fib. On the other hand, younger patients, we tend to bias, even if they're uh, relatively asymptomatic towards um, cardioversion and antiarrhythmic therapy. Uh, patients with heart failure may be a specific group of patients that may benefit from um, interventional uh, therapy as opposed to drug therapy. Um, there's some data suggests that people with congestive heart failure may do better um, in terms of quality of life as well as uh, perhaps even survival uh, with ablation as opposed to uh, antiarrhythmic therapy. On the other hand, patients with normal hearts, generally speaking, 
uh, antiarrhythmic therapy with cardioversion is the primary treatment of choice. Um, atrial fibrillation as primary treatment is not considered um, treatment of choice. The other question, of course, is how long people have their atrial fib. So uh, again, 24 hours uh, seems to be the cutoff in terms of when we think it's uh, reasonable uh, to proceed with um, cardioversion in the absence of anticoagulation. Uh, and if it's a uh, episode of atrial fibrillation, say related to um, uh, holiday heart, as we say, um, one could cardiovert without necessarily committing to antiarrhythmic therapy. So antiarrhythmic choices, <clears throat> there's um, primarily a, a first group, um, and there the efficacy uh, for persistent atrial fibrillation tends to run 50 to 60% at the end of the year. Uh, these would be uh, flecainide, of course, in the presence of a uh, normal heart, uh, sotalol or propafenone. Uh, also listed in that group is Maltac, which um, you may be aware is an analog of amiodarone. However, uh, my own experience with it is that it does not offer much protection um, for atrial fibrillation, so I typically don't use it. If patients fail uh, the first group, uh, one can consider a second group, which uh, has a higher rate of efficacy, um, and that would be amiodarone. Um, this may be, uh, say, first choice in a patient who is older. Um, so if you just want to use one medication uh, to see if it works, uh, amiodarone works pretty well. But because of the issues associated with long-term therapy, um, younger patients may be um, a little less um, appropriate uh, for long-term amiodarone, uh, one can consider dephetylide, uh, which is a um, drug similar activity uh, to amiodarone and, and probably just as effective. So the current indications for atrial fibrillation uh, as well as atrial fibrillation treatment, either ablation or uh, drug therapy is quality of life. Uh, sometimes the symptoms are pretty obvious. Um, people will say they have sudden onset of palpitations, decreased exercise tolerance, shortness of breath, uh, and those are usually pretty straightforward. Uh, occasionally, though, particularly with longer standing atrial fibrillation, it's unclear to what extent uh, fatigue or dyspnea on exertion may be related to the atrial fibrillation. And that uh, kind of makes it difficult to know um, whether intervention will make a difference, whether medical or not. Um, so in patients with, uh, say, more sustained atrial fib, one might be tempted to try to cardiovert with antiarrhythmic therapies, um, even if it's a short-term solution, just to see if they feel better before committing them to ablation. So the most common indication would be failure or intolerance to antiarrhythmic therapies. Um, usually those are um, in that first group. And as I mentioned before, patients with heart failure may be a, a particular group where uh, ablation may be considered first choice. So there have been a number of ways of, of looking at um, uh, how, how one judges success. And um, I, I will preface this by saying that um, in part, the literature is a bit of a mess, and we'll go into that in a little bit, but uh, there have been attempts to take a look at particular types of patients that may be uh, less um, likely to be successfully ablated, and uh, in this study where they looked at uh, different types of um, risk factors, uh, persistent atrial fibrillation was uh, less likely to be uh, curative than paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, as one might expect. Uh, atrial fibrillation is a is a uh, progressive disease, and so when people are going intermittent atrial fibrillation, it's generally early in disease. They have less scarring, as we'll see. Patients with uh, enlarged uh, left atrial size uh, also is an indicator of sort of chronic uh, atrial fibrillation. There's expansion of the left atrium, anything about five centimeters, um, and certainly six is considered. Um, you know, less likely to be successful. And the other interesting thing is that uh, coronary artery disease also uh, tended to be a marker for uh, less success. And this is uh, just the, the whole group of, of things that they, they looked at. Um, and as I say, the um, 
the other three were the primarily the uh, the issue they saw. As you can see, over um, uh, a year four year period, uh, patients with coronary artery disease has less success. Patients with uh, persistent atrial fib have less success, and uh, left atrial size has a significant impact as well. Um, so they developed a, a score, and, and one can apply that to patients to try to assess uh, what the likelihood of um, success is. Uh, the maximum score there is 13, and you just plug the patients in for um, these risk factors. People have also looked at, you know, sort of long-term uh, effects. And as you can see, um, uh, there, there is uh, some decrease in uh, efficacy over time. Uh, we'll get back to that question in a, in a minute, but I, I think that reflects really the um, progressive nature of the disease um, that one uh, can intervene initially. Uh, and then there's the rest of the atrium uh, which can have progressive disease. And um, this was a, a sort of a meta-analysis. Um, and, and again, uh, we see uh, persistent uh, atrial fibrillation have um, kind of less uh, likelihood of, of a good outcome. But you'll also notice that multiple procedures are commonly necessary. Um, typically, um, we think uh, that's more uh, common in more persistent types of uh, atrial fibrillation where you have to go back in. Uh, in part, it, as we'll see, it sort of depends on the technique used, um, but one can anticipate 15 to 20% of patients will have to have more than one procedure. And uh, again, this, this just shows um, there is a, a decrement uh, the interesting thing is that a lot of times um, the, the main um, change in overall efficacy occurs quite early in the um, history. Uh, as you can see, in the first year and a half or so, most of the patients uh, have, have lost uh, sinus rhythm, uh, and uh, then it, it kind of flattens out. So I, I think it's important to sort of um, uh, keep a uh, somewhat jaded eye on uh, the literature. Um, as I say, it, it's sort of emperor's clothes. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, why, you know, are the um, outcomes different than, than what people report? And uh, I think it, in part, it's sort of an artifact of the type of uh, studies that, that are done in atrial fibrillation. Most of these studies are single center studies. Most of them are um, dealing with the first year outcome, so we're not looking at long-term outcomes. And the main problem is that people use different techniques. Um, we sort of think of um, atrial fibrillation as kind of a, a monolithic um, therapy, but it, it really isn't. Um, uh, people do different things, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And as I say, uh, there may be some significant differences between short-term and long-term results. Um, and I, I remember, you know, sitting at meetings, and every year, uh, you know, the, the group from Bordeaux would talk about how they have 95% success, and then they next year would present uh, a change in their their type of ablation, and then they have 95% success. So. Um, I, I think one has to deal with it somewhat cautiously. And then the other question is, how do you define success? Um, one could look at clinical symptoms, for example, and um, patients uh, may not have uh, symptoms associated with recurrent atrial fibrillation. Um, do we call that a success or not? Well, clinically it is, but if you record atrial fib, it's, it's a failure. And it's felt that if you have more than 30 seconds of atrial fib, um, then that would constitute a failure in most studies. But again, 30 seconds is pretty short. And the, probably the more exact way to do it is uh, looking at burden, which um, requires a device implantation. So um, not, not many patients uh, have that. Um, 
and actually insurance typically won't cover uh, implantable recording for, for that purpose. So the truth is that the type of ablation that's performed is in part uh, really depends on the physician performing the procedure. Um, so there will be variability between uh, even centers. Um, for example, how I might do an ablation versus uh, Dr. Rhodes or um, Dr. Mazur. Um, and, and at this point, um, there, there isn't any um, obvious uh, you know, advantages to different types of approaches. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my own approach uh, and why I think it, it may be better. But um, at, at this point, um, that there really just isn't any standard other than to say that isolation of the pulmonary veins uh, appears to be important in um, achieving success in patients with atrial fibrillation. Now, the atrial, uh, the, the pulmonary veins uh, enter the, the left atrium in the back portion of the heart. And uh, it's, it's known that uh, a lot of uh, irritability and automaticity occurs uh, in the uh, pulmonary veins. And, and that was one of the reasons it was attributed uh, to success. Um, I think more likely it's related to uh, the fibrosis that occurs in atrial fibrillation. This process, uh, I believe, is um, seen earliest around the pulmonary veins. The point, of course, is that in uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the success rate is uh, 70 to 80 percent um, at, at the end of the year. And as expected, uh, patients with persistent atrial fibrillation don't do as well. Um, so at the end of the year, it's more 50 to 60%. Um, and, and again, uh, depending on the, the type of approach that's, that's been used, um, when these approaches were um, tested in combination with just pulmonary uh, vein isolation, there wasn't seen to be uh, a significant improvement And there's a lot of fads uh, associated with um, atrial fibrillation. I, I remember initially when it came out, um, <clears throat> people tried to replicate the, the lesions that were made uh, during uh, the surgical maze procedure in the 80s. Uh, and uh, there was some reported success with that, but it, it was not um, uh, encouraging in the long run. Um, then there was looking at uh, premature beats and uh, automaticity in the pulmonary veins. Uh, and, and that's where the focus on pulmonary vein isolation became uh, true. Uh, there was uh, interest in looking at sort of complex atrial electrograms, uh, what we call cafe ablation, uh, but that didn't seem to pan out. Um, there's uh, rotor mapping. Um, own opinions about, but that didn't didn't pan out uh, either. Uh, so again, sort of PVI and, and what are called single shot solutions um, have have uh, basically been sort of the mainstay. Now I will say uh, that I do have some some biases, and uh, one is that um, we we should map. Uh, everything we ablate. Uh, there's a tendency, I think, in electrophysiology now uh, to do things anatomically based. Uh, for example, just do a pulmonary vein isolation, not look at the rest of the atrium. Uh, my own approach uh, as a result of, of mapping is that maybe we should consider uh, targeting uh, abnormal areas of substrate. Um, and I'll demonstrate why I think that may be important. Um, but a general sort of way of looking at it is, is looking at overall voltage to uh, assess underlying substrate. So there is some heresy associated with this. Um, number one, uh, that one could approach uh, individualized uh, substrate modification uh, based on the voltage gradient map, uh, that AF ablation doesn't necessarily require transmural or contiguous lesions. Uh, that we should treat basically people with early as well as late um, or persistent uh, atrial fibrillation the same way. In other words, uh, treat the underlying substrate. Uh, 
And my belief is that PVI primarily works uh, on the basis of defragmentation rather than prevention of premature beats. So uh, I, I say that as, as sort of a um, caution um, that you, you'll not necessarily get um, that view from other centers. But I think it's important when talking to patients about atrial fibrillation really to, to manage expectations. Um, you know, there, there, there are um, uh, places that, that talk about 90% efficacy. Um, and, um, you know, again, there's a lot of variability about how people report it. Um, but I, I think the bottom line is, is that in any individual patient, we can't say with certainty who it's going to work for. Um, so that's what I tell my patients. Um, as I say, there are uh, some aspects of uh, the risk factors that, that may be important in terms of um, success. Um, but it's also important to bear in mind that 15 to 20 percent of the patients will have to have more than one procedure. So ablation is not necessarily an endpoint, um, unlike, say, Will Parkinson White or other types of SVTs, where there's a specific area you ablate and it's gone and they're cured. Uh, atrial fibrillation is not that way. And so <clears throat> we have to see how patients do and react. So it's, it's more of a process than an endpoint. And recurrent arrhythmias as a result of the ablation somewhat depend on the type of ablation that was performed. Um, for example, uh, PVI alone, uh, patients commonly present more with atrial fibrillation than they do with atrial flutters, whereas if you do substrate modification, we'll see more of these atrial flutters as opposed to atrial fibrillation as a recurrence. And obviously, complications are an important um, aspect of a, a, any sort of intervention. Um, local vascular issues, uh, you know, we go through the, the vein, so usually it's not a major issue, but there's an artery that sits next to it, so people can get um, pseudoaneurysms and communications, so uh, local vascular issues are of concern. Uh, the more common complications are cardiac tamponade. Um, that happens about one in 300 times. Um, there's a perforation that occurs most of the time. Uh, we don't know uh, what catheter went through. Uh, the good news is typically um, one can uh, drain the, the blood and once you do that, the heart sort of seals. So I would say, you know, 99% of the time patients don't require any surgical repair. Um, but, it, but it is a, a, a significant complication. Um, and, and obviously the next issue is uh, related to um, CVA. And um, that's because we're working in the left atrium. Um, so typically we'll leave people on their anticoagulation and then uh, we actually give them heparin during the case. Um, and then uh, we need to leave them on anticoagulation for at least uh, a month afterwards. Uh, in part, it sort of depends on the underlying CHADS VAS. Some people, uh, if they don't have recurrent atrial fibrillation, uh, the physicians will discontinue the anticoagulation. Uh, I think um, my concern in a high risk uh, or high CHADS VAS patient that I, I'm probably not going to discontinue anticoagulation. Um, because uh, people can have episodes of atrial fibrillation and not really know it and still be at risk. The risk for stroke is probably somewhere in the one in 400 to 500 range. So current approaches in terms of uh, pulmonary vein isolation involve uh, two uh, primary approaches. One is um, what we call a WACA, which is a, uh, a wide area uh, ablation. And basically the idea is to uh, create linear lesions uh, around the pulmonary veins uh, in the atrial antrum. Um, and I would say uh, that, you know, that's radiofrequency energy. And um, I would say probably the majority of patients uh, are, are, are getting wackas. Um, 
single shot PVIs, um, cryo balloon like uh, the Medtronic um, Arctic Front. Um, it has also been used successfully. Um, basically, you can inflate a balloon into the pulmonary vein and freeze it uh, and, and accomplish the isolation that way. Um, this has led to other types of uh, balloon type procedures. There's a laser balloon. Uh, it's kind of interesting because you can uh, actually has an endoscope in it and you can uh, adjust uh, the laser. Um, the newest uh, sort of rave is um, multi-duty, multi-electrode mesh um, electrodes. Again, uh, it's, it's basically RF that that um, you put in the pulmonary vein um, and do the isolation. So um, for example, the, the, the WACA, as you can see, uh, the patient has a point to point um, uh, ablation and uh, those are the red and you can see um, purple is um, higher voltage. Um, and you can see there's no voltage in the pulmonary veins, the result of uh, the WACA. Uh, as you can see, it's a contiguous lesion. Uh, the cryo balloon, a uh, similar sort of effect. Um, uh, the balloon goes into the pulmonary vein, it freezes, and as you can see, again, there is uh, a fairly discreet uh, area of um, block uh, into the pulmonary vein. Um, there are technical challenges. Sometimes the veins are big, sometimes they come off at off angles. Um, so, so there can be some uh, technical issues with um, cryoablation. And sometimes those patients require um, sort of touch up. And this is that uh, the sort of um, other mousetraps. Uh, this is the laser balloon uh, where you can actually see inside the pulmonary vein. Um, these are the, the multi-duty uh, electrodes where you can basically uh, create um, linear lesions around the um, uh, pulmonary vein antrum. And, and so, as you can see, there's sort of a complex matrix of different types of approaches, um, some of them related to, um, you know, uh, stepwise approaches, isolation, PV triggers, uh, antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, people do uh, ganglion plexus uh, ablations, uh, isolations of low voltage, um, and, and basically that's the problem uh, because people are looking for different uh, alternative uh, approaches that may offer a, a better outcome. So, you know, why, why do I uh, focus on uh, substrate ablation? Well, as I say, I don't think um, atrial fibrillation is, uh, is really about automaticity. It's, it's not a, a poorly timed PAC. Um, for example, uh, you wouldn't necessarily treat ventricular tachycardia by going after a, a PVC. You go after by going the underlying substrate. And, and therefore, I think you know, atrial fib is mediated by a substrate. And although there's some disagreement about um, how one measures that, my own view is that if you look at relative voltages, um, it, it really does represent um, substrate. And the advantage is that, you know, if you can target um, the ablation, you can deliver sort of minimal uh, damage um, to the rest of the atrium. Um, the left atrium is kind of interesting in that the activation, the um, uh, wiring is basically external, it's not internal. So when one looks at substrate, you have to say, okay, does it really reflect a method of conduction? Is it independent of the rhythm that you recorded? For example, it should be the same in atrial fib as it is in sinus rhythm, otherwise it's not substrate. And then obviously you should be able to see it being altered in, in, the, um, in the process. And so we're sort of used to looking at activation uh, as electrophysiologists, how electricity goes from one point to the other um, rather than the underlying substrate. So what I would suggest is instead of looking at cars, we can, we can look at, at the underlying highways. And um, as you can see, if you wanna go from uh, Iowa City to Sacramento, uh, you can follow a highway. So you don't need to know where the cars are. 
This is an example of a, a low, what I call a low voltage bridge. Um, this was actually for uh, AV nodal reentry, um, but an ablation here causes uh, significant changes in terms of activation. So we did uh, report a, a series of um, outcomes in, in patients, and I won't bore you with all the details, but I, I think the, the takeaways are, if you look at people with proxismal atrial fibrillation, as you can see, um, there's a lot of uh, purple, which is higher voltage, um, and there's these red and yellow areas. These are uh, low voltage bridges. And you can see right around the pulmonary veins, there's a, there's a lot of fragmentation. And then if you go into more persistent or chronic atrial fib, now the voltage is quite low and there's just a lot of uh, scarring and low voltage um, bridges present. Um, here's an example where you can see uh, a low voltage bridge going into a pulmonary vein. There's high voltage here and high voltage in the left atrium, but you can uh, ablate that low voltage bridge and uh, interesting things happen. There's uh, isolation of the pulmonary vein. Um, you can see uh, loss of, of voltage um, in, within the pulmonary vein. Um, here you can see uh, a patient with atrial fibrillation. Again, lots of uh, fragmentation around the pulmonary veins, uh, which I think is why it works. Um, but if you target the um, low voltage bridges, as you can see, there's just a couple of lesions um, along the back that resulted in uh, fairly significant, as you can see, a uh, change in, um, in voltage in the posterior wall. And this is an example of uh, a patient that uh, is in sinus rhythm above and in atrial fibrillation below. And as you can see, there's, there's pretty good correlation between uh, sort of the fragmentation bridge points and absence of voltage. Um, when they're in normal rhythm and when they're in atrial fibrillation, which again, uh, I think is a necessary component uh, for defining substrate. So acutely, we did pretty well. Um, most of the patients, we had um, uh, 26 in the uh, um, persistent and um, 28, I believe, in the um, proxismal group. Uh, most of the patients actually converted to atrial fibrillation during the ablation, uh, about 88%. Um, it's encouraging, but not necessarily a marker for success. Uh, we were not able to induce atrial fib anymore following um, uh, loss of these uh, endocardial fragments. And the PVs were uh, isolated, but as I say, they were isolated uh, focally rather than um, by linear lesions. Um, some patients uh, required two procedures in the PAF group. As you can see, the majority of them uh, were atrial flutters. Um, we were able to get rid of most of those. And as you can see, if they came back in atrial fib after we did a substrate modification, we didn't do very well on making those patients better, unfortunately. And then this is the five-year result. Uh, and again, uh, you can see there's some decrease in overall efficacy in the first uh, 18 months, but it's a fairly flat curve uh, at, at 60 months. And I, I think my hypothesis going into that was that if we dealt with the um, endocardial fragmentation up front, uh, that over time there, there just wouldn't uh, be progressive fragmentation. Now, obviously, people could develop uh, epicardial disease, they develop right atrial disease. So I, I don't know that this is going to last forever, but I think it's a, an encouraging sign. As you recall, most of the time uh, over a four to five year period, there, there is a, a decrease to 60% uh, or so in the, the PAF group. So as I say, if, if your um, patient had a PVI alone, um, I would say it's most likely they'll recur in atrial fibrillation, but sometimes they do recur in atrial flutters. Um, and then it's sort of up to the um, individual uh, physician in terms of how they next treat it. Some uh, just uh, clear the uh, pulmonary veins because sometimes there is recurrence of conduction in the pulmonary veins and um, getting rid of that takes care of it. Uh, other times, particularly with late recurrence of atrial fib, it's usually um, areas beyond the, the pulmonary vein uh, 
uh, area. If you do a substrate ablation, I would say most of the patients will come back in an atrial flutter. Uh, these are usually atypical and usually uh, left atrial. Uh, the good news is, is that about 90% of those are mappable and ablatable. And once you get rid of the atrial flutters, they, they do fine. They don't have atrial fib anymore. So the hints are that uh, if they have atrial fibrillation, obviously that they, they, they don't really have discrete uh, P waves. They tend to be irregular. Atypical atrial flutters uh, typically just present with a, a regular rate. They're just stuck at 120 or 110. And it may almost look like uh, sinus tachycardia, but if you um, look particularly in B1, a lot of times you can tell there's, there's actually two to one. And, and there are discrete P waves. And as I say, that I think uh, recurrence of an atrial flutter is typically a good sign um, because you get rid of those and then they maintain sinus rhythm. So this is an example of a patient that came back with a, um, an atrial uh, flutter. Uh, in addition, there was sort of reconnection here, as you can see on the, the right pulmonary veins. Um, the esophagus <laughs> was sitting right here, which is why there was a lot more recurrence because um, the esophagus sits right behind the uh, left atrium and you can cook the esophagus, which turns out to be a bad idea people develop um, uh, abscesses and uh, fistulas. And um, uh, that's uh, probably about one in 30,000, but it can be lethal. Anyway, this is a voltage gradient map, um, actually quite, quite low voltage. Um, but you can see there's uh, an area of high voltage uh, here and there, and then this low voltage bridge here. And um, this is a, an activation map and we put our RF right there. And as you can see, um, the, the tachycardia terminates. Um, this is an activation map. So instead of a voltage, you're looking at uh, how the electricity goes around in the heart. Um, so the white is, is where it's coming through. Uh, red is going this way uh, to orange and then around to blue and then when it, <clears throat> it hits blue and white, um, that's a sort of the link between early and late. So a lesion here was successful in terminating the atrial flutter and this patient's done you know, very well since then. Now, if an ablation fails, if it's a first ablation, one can consider a repeat, that's pretty standard. Uh, multiple failures, I think it sort of depends on, on what you see. Um, uh, multiple flutters, I guess, probably reasonable to do. Multiple fibs, I'm not sure. As I mentioned before, the results are, are kind of poor with um, repeat uh, flutter ablations in, this, in the setting of a, of a substrate modification. Um, so the alternatives are um, you, can, you can just go to rate control um, and um, again, typically patients will, will probably be in more persistent types of, of rhythms. If they're not persistent, then, you know, rechallenging with antiarrhythmics may be reasonable um, because sometimes medicines will work where they didn't work before. Um, so it's always worth trying. Um, but if they're consistently out of rhythm, um, rate control uh, with uh, nodal blocking agents, uh, AV nodal ablation with pacemaker um, might be appropriate for a patient um, again, with either sustained arrhythmia or poorly controlled uh, recurrence. Uh, we used to do that in the old days all the time. Uh, patients do quite well with it. Um, most of the time, they don't know they're out of rhythm anymore. And um, I, I think it's a, it's a reasonable alternative. As I say, rechallenging with medication is always a, a reasonable thing to do. So uh, in conclusion, I, I guess uh, I would leave you with um, the fact that um, atrial fibrillation treatment is, uh, is complex and um, needs to be individualized. And that's why um, you know, one, one uh, size doesn't fit all. Um, and <clears throat> the, the treatments can be uh, quite complicated. Um, and as, as we talked about with uh, ablation, there's a fair amount of unknown um, and I think that's the time when you just have to talk to the patient to, to develop uh, 
realistic outcomes uh, and expectations, um, sorry, expectations for outcomes um, so that everybody understands um, where, um, where the risks are and where the benefits are uh, and where we'll go if uh, there's a failure. And uh, I think one should uh, always, um, well, I always address that at the time that we talk about um, the ablation just to put in context um, that the ablation isn't the end all. And if uh, there is a, um, uh, a recurrence, uh, we still have things we can, we can offer. Um, and I think with that, I would um, open to any questions. Are there any questions? Oh, we have a couple of chat things. Oh, no. So if you, uh, if you want to ask, uh, go ahead. Otherwise you can type a message. We'll also be sending out your contact information afterwards. So if people do have follow-up questions, they can feel free to reach out to you as well. Mm -hmm. So oh, for, for the sake of time and over lunch, then um, I know a lot of people do appreciate being able to reach out to you and, and they do with the rest of um, the heart and vascular team as well. So um, mm -hmm. on behalf of the entire heart and vascular team, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's presentation with Dr. Balin. And like we said, if you do, if you would like more information or to talk with him directly, I will be sending out that information. Um, so. We'll also be sending out a link to this recording and a, a reminder for the remaining upcoming CME presentations as well. So we thank you for joining us today. Dr. Balin, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Definitely appreciate that. And thank everybody, you. I hope you have a great day. <laughs>